Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to the third panel of the Civil Society Forum of the Berlin Process. My name is Walter Kaufmann. I'm the head of the Department for Eastern and Southeastern Europe at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, which is the green affiliated political foundation um, in Germany. Um, it's my pleasure to chair this short panel on the green, agending, the green agenda committing to sustainable Europe. Before I will introduce to you our panelists, let me say a few words on the topic of our discussion. When it comes to green issues, and particularly the Green Deal of the European Union, we have not been missing sound and sometimes even pathetic statements over the last two years, even in regard to the Western Balkans. Remember when the U European Green Deal was unveiled in December 2019, EU Commission President van der Leyen called it Europe's man on the moon, on the moon moment. Ten months later, in October 2020, the Berlin Process Summit in Sofia adopted the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans as an extension of the European Green Deal. As the communique reads, quote, we have today agreed to fully endorse the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans and express our commitment to implement actions in the following five pillars, and then come the following pillars. First, climate, energy, mobility. Second, circular economy. Third, depollution, which means monitoring and prevention of pollution. Fourth, sustainable agriculture. And fifth, protection of biodiversity. This declaration was followed by several statements of West Balkan leaders, just to quote the Serbian president Vucic, who said last December in 2020, Serbia must become a climate neutral society by 2050. Well, this sounds ambitious and promising. It looks like West Balkan leaders have unanimously embarked on the train for green transition. In reality, however, we see at least a much more ambivalent or mixed picture in regard to the transition from coal power generation to renewables. Some countries develop exit plans, other construct new coal plants. Regarding the reduction of air pollution, regarding the fulfilling of obligations under the European Energy Community Treaty, or regarding bio biodiversity obligations that run counter, for example, to small hydropower projects still mushrooming all over the region. At this introductory panel, and this panel will be followed by several workshops on the same topic uh, this afternoon and tomorrow, we first want to assess the potential that the Green Agenda for the West Balkan offers to the region, the challenges it faces, and probably most important, what political instruments and leverage need to be developed and employed to implement the Green Agenda in the sense of a profound ecological and social modernization of the West Balkan economies. How to avoid its abuse as an instrument for greenwashing? And how can the Berlin process help in generating the necessary political energy behind the Green Agenda? I'm very pleased uh, to introduce to you my distinguished panelists. Uh, first, uh, Mrs. Uh, Guillemette Vache. She works as a policy officer at the European Commission, uh, Commission covering environment and climate change at DGNIA and the Department for Western Balkans Regional Cooperation and Programs. Second is Sonia Risteska. She is a project officer for Southeast Europe at the environmental think tank Agora Energiewende. Then we have Mr. Samuel Lemesh from Senica. He is a professor at the Polytechnic Faculty of the University of Seneca and the president of the steering board uh, of the NGO Ecoforum Zenica. And last but not least, Vladimir Djurjevic from Belgrade, Associate Professor on Meteorology at the Faculty of Physics and one of the co-leaders of the largest national research project in Serbia related to climate modeling and climate change. We will have the following procedure, um, two short rounds among the panelists, and then we open up uh, for you, for the audience, you have both the chance to come in 
through the Q&A function, uh, through the chat, or um, also you can raise your hand and I will give you uh, the floor to raise uh, your question or to give your comment um, orally. So, um, but to start with um, our panelists, I would like to start with Mrs. Uh, Vache. Um, the Green Agenda for the Western Balkan, Ms. Vache, is an important progressive policy document. Um, I have started, however, with a rather critical assessment of the current state of affairs regarding the implementation of the Green Agenda, or let's say the readiness to start implementation. Um, of course, it's still too short e and even for an kind of intermediate evaluation, but what is your assessment of the starting conditions? Um, what are the main challenges and what could or should the Berlin process contribute to make the West Balkan Green Agenda project stronger? Ms. Vashi, the floor is you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaufman, and uh, good afternoon from my side to all. Uh, I would like uh, to first warmly thank the, the Aspen Institute and uh, the South East Europe Association for, for the invitation to this panel discussion and uh, more generally for the organization of this uh, CSO forum to feed in the, the Berlin process. Um, I welcome very much our, our exchange today, uh, given the key role civil society organizations play in, in the Western Balkans. From my perspective of uh, dealing with environmental and climate issues for quite some years now in, uh, in DG NIA, uh, working with CSO is, is really a necessity, given their, their crucial watchdog role and, and their contribution to democratic debates. So that's, uh, I think, important point I wanted to, first of all, to, to make. But let me now briefly answer your, your questions. Um, so on the uh, assessment that we are, we are doing uh, on our side, uh, so from the Commission perspective on the current situation and the starting condition of, of the Western Balkans regarding the, the Green Agenda, well, um, like in the EU member states, uh, environment degradation and climate change are of course of increasing concern of, uh, of the people in the region. Uh, but it's true that the Western Balkans are expected to be affected above average uh, by climate change. They are strongly dependent on highly polluted coal uh, power plants, uh, with cities recording um, lowest air quality in the world sometimes, especially in winter. At the same time, and that's where also I, I would like to bring a bit of more positive notes, uh, the region retains really a, a significant proportion of uh, European biodiversity with pristine natural habitats, which if protected can really be um, an opportunity in the sense that it will help uh, reducing the impact of climate change and product, produce tangible results. Um, now, uh, the, the main objective of the Green Agenda is to turn these challenges into opportunities and to switch to a modern, resource efficient and competitive uh, economy, so economies in, in the regions, where basically growth is decoupled from emission and uh, resource use and waste generation. So that's really an ambitious goal. But of course, we need, uh, as you were saying, to take into account that the starting point is different for, for the Western Balkans uh, in general compared, compared to the EU in terms of uh, policies, in terms of energy security, or in terms of access to financing. So from several perspectives. Um, concretely, the Green Agenda, which is foreseen uh, in the Green Deal itself, as one of these, its 47 actions, is really mirroring its objective, but is adapted to the, to the circumstances of, of the region. So to summarize the ambition, the destination of, of the travel is the same, given the European perspective of the Western Balkans, but the, the journey itself might be more gradual and will of course not, not happen overnight. In some cases, however, um, leapfrogging would, would be really encouraged, uh, for example, for, for the shift from linear to, to circular economy. So that would be to, to answer your, your first question on, on the starting point. Now, of course, uh, this uh, green agenda for the Western Balkans is a challenge in itself. Its implementation is a challenge in, in itself. The adaptation of the Western Balkans economies, administration and system to the new green paradigm will, will be uh, costly. And it will also require strong political commitment across the board to implement really transformational policy reforms. So that's why the Green Agenda really requires a whole economy and a whole government approach um, and will therefore imply 
better IT implementation, better IT enforcement, strong interinstitutional uh, coordination. So that's a bit the, the traditional challenges that we, we anyway see in, in the process of accession negotiation. And in addition, a number of financing instruments and mechanism will need to be really deployed from national budgets, from international donors, and, and from private sectors. So the EU stands by the regions in terms of technical and, and financial support. And that also, of course, a point I wanted to, to stress here, notably through the new instrument for pre-accession assistance, uh, EPA3. Now, uh, being conscious of the time, just to, to, to finish on the, the last question on the, whether the, the Berlin process I mean, how the Berlin process could contribute to make the Western Balkan Green Agenda uh, project stronger. Well, just first to, to, to clarify that the Green Agenda, we really see more than just a project, but really, you know, the, the guiding framework to, to shift paradigm and to guide um, both international and, and domestic, uh, domestic actions uh, to, 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 to go for, for a green transition. Um, of course, the Berlin process, when it was created in, in 2014, re responded to a genuine need. On the one hand, uh, there was a need to strengthen regional cooperation among Western Balkans. And on the other hand, for EU member states, um, there was a need to demonstrate that the Western Balkans are part of the, of the European family. And uh, just to say that both Poznan and Sofia summits within the Berlin process did play a key role in the development of, of the Green Agenda by bringing Western Balkans together, committing to a common and ambitious goal on their way to the EU. So I, I think the fact that it brings um, uh, Western Balkan leaders and some member states around the same table and uh, enable, secure the, 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 necessity, uh, the necessary sorry, political ownership, which, which is uh, necessary for such an ambitious uh, process. Um, so there is a, a top-down dimension, let's say, but there's also a bottom-up dimension. And I think today's event is, is the best proof of it, that uh, out of uh, 10 working group of this uh, CSO forum, three are dedicated to, to the Green Agenda. So I think the, the civil society forum within the Paris process has indeed a role to play, because of course, beyond financing, uh, significant efforts to, to, to shift uh, to the Green paradigm are necessary all around, I mean, throughout the society. Um, we say being, uh, I mean, it comes from regulatory level to uh, produce, promoting new consumer habits or behavior, um, enhancing regional cooperation on cross-border issues, etc. So civil society and local communities will really play a crucial role in supporting such efforts and, and reform, as well, of course, as mobilizing citizens and leaders at all levels for a just, inclusive and, uh, and green transition. So I really think that the, the Berlin process is, is an excellent framework to do so. Um, I could say also a word on the role of uh, regional organizations that the transport and energy mm. community, but I, I will leave it uh, here for now and looking forward to the discussion. Mm. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ms. Vashi. So I understood the direction is clear. The journey may be more gradual, um, but it's uh, ongoing and we need more alignment of political instruments, more political commitment, and the civil society has an important role to play um, in mobilizing. Also regional cooperation, which is of course both politically and technically extremely important when it comes to green transition. Um, Sonia, um, I know that uh, Agora is um, engaging a lot in trying to develop scenario of scenario of facing out coal and substituting it with uh, renewables. Um, it's the elephant in the room yeah, that uh, the, most of the West Balkan countries, but Albania are still very much dependent on coal power plants and coal energy. And they are not just uh, continuing uh, subsidizing coal, uh, often or sometimes in violation of legal frameworks, but even some of them are constructing um, or developing new coal power plant road projects, mostly with Chinese money. Um, how should the EU, the, its green agenda, address this topic? And how do you assess recent developments around Kolubara uh, B in, in Serbia, um, introduction of carbon pricing in mm. Northern Macedonia? Are we already on the path, uh, but for this uh, coal, coal power plant projects? How is your assessment? Thank you, thank you, Walter. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, yes, we, I mean, we are, I would be cautiously maybe optimistic 
that uh, we are on the path. Uh, however, whether it should be speeded up, yes, definitely. Unfortunately, even though there have been some positive developments in the region concerning um, abandoning uh, new coal projects, uh, like it happened, I think, a year or two ago, I think it was before the pandemic in, in Kosovo, then the, the Kolubara one just a few weeks ago. Um, it's none of the countries which have uh, lignite. Um, uh, the countries mainly use lignite in the Western Balkans, not mainly, but like 100%. Uh, none of them have uh, actually announced uh, any coal fuel plans. And um, this is, of course, very important. If you want to decarbonize your power sector, um, you need to have an announced coal fuel You need to have a plan in place uh, because this is not something that everybody knows that it's not happening from one day to the other but you need years, uh, sometimes decades, uh, in order to be able for the countries to transition from coal to clean um, uh, energy or electricity in this case. Um, it, because it's not only about the, um, the power system and the stability of the power system, but it's also about just transition and actually uh, finding a solution for all the people who are employed in the sector, um, because we know that they will be hardly hit. Um, this is not something that it's, uh, it's a secret. Uh, and also for the regions who mainly depend uh, who, whose economies depend mainly on, on the uh, production of electricity from, from lignite. Uh, can the, um, the, the Western Balkans Green Agenda help? Of course it can. Uh, I, that is the whole point of why it was introduced as maybe, as I like to call it colloquial, the little sister of the, of the EU Green Deal. Uh, but um, there is one main difference. Uh, this is not something that uh, the countries have to implement. This is a pledge. This is something that they sign that they will. But unlike the EU Green Deal, uh, there are no targets. Uh, there are no targets under the um, Green Agenda for the Western Balkans of how much you need to lower your emissions uh, up to what year. There are no targets for renewables deployment. There are no targets for um, uh, energy efficiency. Um, so uh, even though there is a, a, a pledge to, of course, um, uh, follow the uh, EU member states and, and to converge uh, the region, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, still um, uh, the, one, the main things uh, which should be in place in order for that to happen are missing, and that's the setting of targets of how much we want to see renewables in 2030 in the region, on national, regional level, um, uh, how much we want to see emissions reduction, uh, apart from the indices. So they're also very different. Like if you see the Bosnian indice, for instance, with the one from North Macedonia, there are quite big discrepancies. Um, and um, uh, also um, plans for, for coal phase out. Because what is, what is it that we want to achieve? There are funds available. Unfortunately, as well here, things are not going, I would say, in the quite right direction. Because if you see the economic and investment plan, which should actually help implement the, the, the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans, currently, at least, um, most of the projects envisaged in the, in the flagship initiative under coal transition are gas. Actually, almost all of them are. There is only one infrastructure project concerning electricity. All of the others are about gas infrastructure or fossil gas infrastructure. Of course, um, yes, there, 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 there is maybe a completely different debate of how much gas do we need in the region and how much infrastructure about gas we need in the region, also concerning future hydrogen development. Uh, I, would not, I would not talk about that, but... Um, uh, what we really need in order to see how much we need investments in what kind of, um, um, I would say, uh, infrastructure, we first need to set up targets about what we want to achieve actually up until up until um, uh, uh, what year and then not because the risk of stranded assets, the risk of, of, of again locking in the region in, in fossil fuel, it's quite um, it's quite big. Um, and this needs to be avoided. And there are funds for that. There is I would say somewhat the political will, uh, maybe not uh, between the, the political elites currently governing, but uh, for instance, the, the utilities are quite aware of that. The civil society is quite aware of that. Um, the EU side, of course, the partners from the EU side are quite aware of that. So there is, I would say, good, uh, now good environment, especially with the regional, I would say, partners starting to decarbonize or starting uh, to, to do the coal phase. Like Greece, for instance, Romania also semi-announced a coal phase by 2020. 32. So there is, uh, there is also market pressure we see from renewables in Serbia, when you have really an influx of investors wanting to come and trying to invest, which also push even more or put even more pressure on the, I would say, incumbent utilities uh, who try to invest even, I mean, still in, in, in Lignite. Um, there is the pressure to introduce CO2 pricing or to introduce some sort of a ETS. 
probably there will be the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which will also hit electricity imports in the EU, which will have a great impact on the exports from the region to the EU. So there is, I would say, an environment in, like much stronger than maybe a few years ago, which will impact the decision in the, in the power sector. But um, the, the main, I think, not to repeat myself, but yes, the main things missing are really uh, the political will on national level there, and also setting really uh, pledging officially that they will do the coal phase out and then setting up targets on what really we want to achieve in the next um, 20 and, and 30 years in the region when it comes to the power sector. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sonia. And I think I can directly come to Vladimir. Um, Guillemette Vache has said that uh, from an EU point of view, the, the, the direction is clear. The journey may be gradual, but the direction is clear. Sonia now put it out that there is a lack of political will and I wonder is if, how is the situation in Serbia? Is the situation, is the direction clear? Um, or is it like in some other political areas often unclear where the, where the direction goes? Um, everybody's speaking about uh, European integration, but developments often contradicting. What about the situation in the energy or decarbonization field? Um, you have had recently some decisions, but still very controversial ones. Um, and what, how do you assess the role of international investors here coming from China, but also uh, US money or even European money in fossil infrastructure like gas? How do you assess that? You have to unmute, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Is, is, the question is really nice and super interesting, especially this part, how we're gonna deal with the foreign investments uh, related to the, to, the, to the coal and to the gas here in Serbia, uh, in terms that we signed this document that we already talked about, uh, 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 the SOFIA, SOFIA agreement. So it's it's really interesting. I think we, we still don't have it here in Serbia. We, we we still don't have a clear sign that we recognize that we should follow this uh, not just European but the global global trend of decarbonization. We start to talk about that. We talk about that a little bit more in comparison how how much we talk about that in the past. But I don't don't think that we have a clear signs on that. And in that terms, since that we are civil society forum here, I think that one of the of the answers from civil society community should be that we, we we should use these two words the sofia declaration as much as possible first of all because i think that the general public in serbia and in, in region they don't uh, really recognize this document as important important and i don't also think that many of them don't really know that this document is signed so i think that we should use these two words in terms that that we uh, can help people to understand that, that we sign one really important document. The, the consequences are of that document is really uh, big for us as a society, since that we should also transform ourselves in the same way as it Europe plans to do that. And we see now that China also plans to do that and the United States also uh, they will do that. So th that's one part, this is, <laughs> let's say, our part of the job is to talk about that and to help people to understand and what SOFIA uh, agreement really means and that we should be ready for this kind of transformation. In that terms, talking more about the SOFIA declaration, I think that this discrepancy between what's happening and what we signed will really be smaller. On the other side, talking about these foreign investments, we saw in the last few months really big U-turns from United States and China uh, relating to decarbonization. The, the United States United States uh, joined the Paris Agreement again. They said that they're gonna decarbonize de 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 themselves up to 2050. And on, uh, on another side, the China said that uh, it will also decarbonize the, the whole country by the 2060. Even it is uh, uh, China. China plan is is uh, uh, 10 years lagging behind the European Union and United States. I, I think that their plan as it is presented is more ambitious uh, than Europeans and, and United States because they, they didn't already, they didn't see a uh, reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the recent years uh, in comparison to United States and European Union. We know that both, both of them have already decreased uh, some, uh, some part of emissions, but China is still, still on the upper, on the uphill part of the curve 
and probably the, the, the decreasing the emissions to 2060, it's been a more ambitious job uh, to them in comparison to, to European Union and United States. But on the other side, as I, I think that uh, in the region, we don't see this U-turn in, in, uh, that happened in both, both countries, in the United States and, and in China. So the, the investments that, that are planned here or that we are talking about, like uh, uh, building of new coal power plant in Costolats, uh, financed by and, and built by China, and also we, we heard about gas terminals in Adriatic Sea and Union Sea. I'm not sure uh, right location, but we talk about that in the past. The, uh, that are uh, let's say United States project. It's some kind of discrepancy in terms of what the con that countries do on a national level. The Russia is a sp is a special player here. I think that Russia for many years was was very unclear about the climate change. Uh, declaratively in uh, international negotiation, they, they sign agreement, uh, but th I don't see that Russia have really uh, clear signals how they're going to approach this Paris agreement and how it's going to happen in the future. And uh, in that sense, I'm not sure how they're going to behave here. Probably they will uh, continue with this, uh, uh, let's call gas story and building the gas pipe from Bulgaria to Serbia. And I'm not sure how that that's can going to change in the future. In terms of this uh, Chinese and U United States investments, probably these changes in these countries will, will come into our region in one moment. It's question when it, it's going to come. It's not ha happened in the same way and in the same moment as in the United States and China. So we, we, we're going to probably have some time lag to, to, to uh, hear these uh, signals from the, for, from the country here in the region. So in that sense, I think that we, we should be very careful what we are doing and what we are planning because this signal will come in one moment and if it if if, if this coming of the signal is too late then we're probably going to step step in in some kind of unfavorable developments here so it's 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 not right now it's not clear how is that going to happen third thing what i would like to underline i think that on the international level the, the negotiation within the unf triple c and the next we know we all know that this year is very important meeting in glasgow uh, which is going to be some kind of update of paris agreement i think that international on international scene we, we should put uh, more let's say effort in terms not just to to report this national the term contribution in terms of national borders of the countries. But we also should talk about of these big economies, how, what are their, their determined contribution about uh, foreign investments. So we can, we can say that within the China, we are, have plan for uh, decarbonization up to 2060, but how, how China investments are related to that. You, you can put your emissions somewhere else. You will be the carbon neutral in 2060, but what, what's going to happen for? So on, on that international level, I think that, that we need to see this next step in terms of negotiation. This was very tricky question in the past. Countries did not like to talk about that, but I think that we, we need to open the new chapter. I think that one chapter is, let's say, closed. We see that many countries trying to become carbon neutral, but I think that also we should, we should have discussion about that uh, foreign emissions, let's say, or the emissions related to the investments in, in the foreign countries, uh, or, or the talking about the debt of uh, uh, sending your industry somewhere else uh, and, and putting your emission in other countries. And the last thing I would like to say, it's related to the big financial institutions, like, uh, I mean, for the Europe, uh, EBRD or European Investment Bank, even the World Bank or uh, International Monetary Fund or things like that. I think that these uh, institutions all are also should take very bold position related to the climate change, because all of these investments that we have in the region, let's say that this thermal power plant in Costolas, it will, even that if we have a credit from China, the many other infrastructures should, should be built around that uh, thermal power plant. And that additional infrastructure will not be financed by China. We will probably try to find money somewhere else. And if that money is a climate smart, I think it, it can be a, a barrier for the for the building of this this uh, main thing of, of of the whole project. So, so in that sense, I also should say that all these investments, is, uh, financial institution and investments funds, <clears throat> are also changing their position in terms of of climate uh, cl uh, climate problem. But I think that, that this message from them should be should be also bolder, like saying that uh, we will we will not put or we will not give you a money 
if you're building something which is not uh, uh, in line with, with the green agenda or in line with Paris Agreement and things like that. And the, the, the last, really last point is also, I think that the same thing should be, should be communicated with, with commercial banks. I think that also commercial banks should, should take this position. I think that also that's happening here. I, I will talk about the Serbia because a few days ago I was contacted by people from one financial institution in Serbia. They, they, they asked me about the, the, uh, to, to give them some advice related to the climate change. It, it was interesting, it was very young people. It was not seniors, it was juniors. They, 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 they heard some signals from outside their, uh, uh, from the headquarters, which are not in Serbia. They heard some signals that, that, that they, they, somewhere they, outside they're talking about the, uh, climate change. They, they want to learn about that. They started some small group within institution to try to learn how the climate change is gonna impact their their business here in Serbia, and they contact me uh, wanting to learn more about the climate change. I, I think it's a good signal, but I think that mm. and that these commercial uh, 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 banks should also uh, take should also take a more bold position on, on climate change. And I think that mix of all this, as I said, maybe it's going to help to 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 be better in the future. It's it's really hard question. It's really hard hard to to think about this, but but that that is my proposal at least. Thank you very much, Vladimir. I understood that uh, financial institutions play a very crucial role in taking much bolder decisions than, than so far. And second, I think um, what, you, what you asked for is a much more proactive approach regarding and challenging both the international investors and probably the Serb government to be much more transparent and outspoken about this kind of investment into foresight structure. Yeah, that is yeah, uh, very. Course. Yeah, so this is important, I think, also for the Berlin process. Yeah? How can this yeah. happen? Yeah? You commit on the one side, uh, see the Sofia Declaration, you commit to a green agenda. And yeah. At the same time, you uh, receive uh, big Chinese investments into um, old infrastructure, yeah? um, outside infrastructure. So I think this is, question is quite clear. Samir Lemes, um, Zenica is, um, unfortunately, <laughs> your town is one of the most polluted uh, places in the Western Balkans, statistically, I, I've looked up in it. Um, and I think it's very important to understand from a local perspective, um, how can the green agenda be implemented together with and in the interest of local communities? How can it be linked up to the interests um, and what can be done to share the benefits of investments into renewables with local population. Do you have any examples, any ideas um, how to approach this question? Well, thank you, Walter. Well, th there are uh, really two types of engagement of local communities. One is the environmental democracy, the power of public participation when large projects are implemented. Uh, we use this opportunity in Bosnia and Herzegovina to raise the awareness about the process of local steelworks environmental permitting. And that led to small but uh, visible improvement of the air quality. Another story is about small hydro where civil action made the government to change their approach and to protect the nature. A small hydropower plants went out of control, making only profit for investors by devastating the rivers and the ecosystems. Both these examples are far from final solution. There's still much to be done, but uh, we do see small improvements. So th this is one type of engagement. So it's environmental democracy. Another engagement is about personal involvement, uh, such as prosuming. Uh, existing legal and regulatory framework in the Western Balkans is not appropriate and needs adjustments in order to make significant shift from tycoons and corporations to individuals, to local communities. Uh, for example, the policy guidelines, uh, the document is called Policy Guidelines on Integration of Renewable Self-Consumers or Prosumers. It was prepared by the Energy Community uh, Secretariat. And it introduced the obligation for energy community member states to adopt a legally binding regulatory framework to connect and treat the prosumers. It includes different uh, tools, such as uh, changing the threshold, for example, the exemption from balancing, then deployment of smart metering systems, inclusion of peer-to-peer -peer trade opportunities, 
And the most important is establishing single points of contact to provide customers with information on the rights, obligations, and benefits of becoming prosumers. So this is an example how can individual uh, contribute, but it again requires some action from the other sides of the government. And uh, finally, concerning the green agenda, we have to say that it's not all about funding and money, as our politicians see it. Uh, for all these, uh, we need skilled and knowledgeable individuals who will implement the green agenda. Uh, brain drain from Western Balkans, make this problem higher. And European Union should support us to compensate for the low cost experts that Western Balkans provides to the EU through this emigration. Uh, to, uh, to make this a just transition, European Union should take into, into account that we already sent our experts to European Union. So we need some compensation for that. Otherwise, the green agenda will just remain uh, another piece of paper with unfold promises, uh, unfulfilled promises and nice wishes. And uh, to implement it, we need expertise and knowledge and know-how. So this is it. If, if there are any questions, I would like to discuss and try to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, perspective. Um, and as I don't see yet, um, maybe I'm mistaken, but I don't see any questions yet in the questions and answer section. I please to my audience, I ask you to put your questions or your comments into the questions and answer section or raise your hand uh, electronically, then I can um, let you join um, our discussion. Um, Ms. Vache, maybe you could um, come back to Ms. Amir's last question on expertise yeah, and the, the problem of, of lack of experts. Um, I know that uh, the uh, EU has uh, extended this, co this coal, uh, how it's called, region in, coal region in transition platform uh, to the Western Balkans. Um, can you Briefly explain it, how does it work? Are there any financial instruments to it? Is it, is it a tool that can be used for kind of this transfer of expertise? Yes, sure. Thank you very much for, for the question. And uh, thanks also to all the other uh, panelists because I, I, I took some notes and I think there was uh, some good, uh, good points. Um, on you, the specific question of, of the brain drain, um, of course, uh, this is something that uh, we are um, fully um, having under our radar, let's say, in our, in our actions with the instrument for pre-accession. We work notably um, with a youth guarantee, so we try to um, basically enhance the, the skills of the, of the young uh, in order to uh, make them stay in the region, to simplify a bit. Uh, but then on the specific question of the coal region in transition, the idea is indeed to have a joint platform with the energy community uh, and the World Bank uh, to exchange best practices and indeed to, um, to consider uh, how the, the, the social impact of phasing out of, uh, of coal and moving away from coal needs to be better uh, translated uh, in, uh, in the region towards national uh, government. So it's, it's true that it's uh, it's inspired by the trans just transition mechanism and uh, fund from 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 the EU, but it's a bit more tailor made, uh, and the energy community is uh, is very much in the lead uh, on that uh, together with the uh, with the World Bank. Um, yeah, I think I would. Yeah. Keep Thank it, you very uh, much. Now short. I have <laughs> two participants who raised their hands. Uh, Mr. Udovitsky, would you be the first, please? With your question yes hello thank you very much for giving me this wonderful opportunity to maybe a little more comment but there is ultimately a question in my in my comment um i have heard now since this morning the problems of lack of um, political will for a variety of of issues and right now we're focusing on the green agenda and particularly in relation to the green agenda, I am speaking from knowing a bit the Serbian situation, but I'm sure at least in some other parts of the region, the same happens, which is that 
since there is no political will, there is also a surprisingly lack of knowledge uh, of what actually are the alternatives, what actually are the costs, what are we actually talking about when we want to move um, the region towards a greener future. And uh, to the point that I am willing to say that we are not even sure how much coal reserves we have. I don't think of an honest assessment, and I'm not completely sure that there is a capacity for a capable assessment has been done by the authorities. I speak from my experience also as a former minister of energy and mines and so on. And in all of this period, I haven't seen progress in understanding, in the official understanding of what we have. So my question really is, and I'm not sure whether to whom am I directing it, maybe it's even more for a, a, a message to be sent outside this forum, that if, if this knowledge and if this understanding, which is absolutely necessary in order to be able to understand what are the trade-offs and how, wh who we can, whose interest can be protected and promoted and whose needs to be in a way sacrificed and somehow compensated. Uh, if we don't have this knowledge and if there is no real political will to acquire it, um, it has to be developed outside the official um, channels of, of work or outside the government, yeah. which is ultimately the civil society. But the tools and the, and the methods whereby the EU interacts with civil society, in my opinion, are not adapted to that. Okay, um, thank you very much. Ms. That's the question. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and Sonia, I think is ready to give an answer. Maybe Sonia, you could, you could uh, connect it with an answer to Mrs. Kreti's question in the Q&A. How can the green agenda be effectively implemented if it lacks an enforcement mechanism? So lack of political will, lack of knowledge. Yeah. Um, Sonia, uh, the, yeah, thank you. I mean, the, the, this is, of course, the, the major issue is if there is no enforcement mechanism, if the countries are not part of the EU, um, how can we make them in a way um, um, follow the Green Agenda or the EU Green Deal um, and, and implement um, the tough reforms? Um, well, lots of cooperation. You have a lot of... Um, I would say um, give and take, um, a conditionality of how you tie uh, the, the money which are pledged uh, with what kind of projects, uh, but also working with local communities, etc. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree that there is no knowledge. I have to say I, I, I disagree a bit. Uh, we work quite a lot on, on the regional level. There is knowledge there. Transparency is another issue. It's another issue how uh, much the governments or the political elites are transparent into what's going on in specifically the power sector in their own countries and within the utilities. But the information is there, the data is there. In mo a lot of the cases, this is not published. And I believe one of the major issues is not really uh, translating what is going on or what needs to happen, specifically if we discuss coal phase out and just transition. Uh, to the public. And uh, I'm afraid we are seeing a similar situation. We saw a similar situation how the COVID-19 pandemic was handled when not um, a lot of information or not the right information worth was um, sort of transmitted to, to the citizens of how they need to deal with this, uh, what are the risks, etc. And we see basically the, the similar things happening here. Um, but the local communities, I believe in, in many of the places are actually quite aware of what's going on and are quite aware of the risks. And they, um, many of them would want to join and many of them actually do join any of the platforms or the initiatives and are ready to start with the transformation. On national level, mm -hmm. the situation is different. And we've seen also this in Bulgaria, for instance. Uh, if you talk with the, the Maritza, East Maritza region, people from there, they're quite aware that the, you know, the coal phases will happen at one point in Bulgaria. But if you talk to the, you know, the, the, the government or the, the, the people in Sofia, it's a, it's a completely different picture. And we see the similar situation in the Western Balkans. And this is something where civil society really can help. But I, I also think it still said it does help a lot. Just see the initiatives against the damaging small hydropower plants. This was literally done by local communities and, and civil society organizations. So this is something that I think can only be upscaled. And of course, I agree that the communication, um, Brussels, uh, Berlin, um, the region uh, needs to be improved uh, in this regard as well. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We will now take uh, two questions in a row from Mr. Popovic and Mr. Shishko. Please, Mr. Popovic, come in. Yes, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Thank you for uh, inspirative introductory presentation. I would focus on uh, certain certain issues which I think lay behind uh, the Green Agenda process. It is, uh, the, I think, that the political actors in the Western Balkans uh, very smartly use this framework to explain as that new era is coming, but nothing happened before. And for, from my point of view, it is the, the question of accountability and the question of trust as well. How we can trust to, to those uh, political actors which fail to implement energy community treaty, which are in a very, very difficult position in application of EU environmental climate and energy standards. And now we need to trust them that they will implement and they will commit to implementation of a green agenda. I don't trust them to be honest. And I think that strong and robust accountability mechanism is needed. And uh, uh, in order just not to comment on the on the situation we are in, I think that civil society forum is opportunity for to, to be transformed in independent monitoring mechanism of green agenda implementation, because we already have a capacities of civil society for monitoring and reporting. And we also have reporting processes within energy community and the European Union as well. So I think we need the process which will be kind of follow up to this uh, to this uh, reporting processes. And I think the civil society forum should be transformed in a, such, a, such a dialogue forum for assessment of of progress, and I think that this is the way how partly accountability will be will be will be reached. On the other hand, I I think since I'm coming from the NGO with, with which working mainly on legal instruments for improvement of environment and climate, I think that exposure to legal and social responsibility is of utmost report importance, and uh, I count on the support of European Union and international partners in that in that sense. So I think that it is important that those actors which fail to implement their obligation need to be responsible for that. And finally, what is important process behind, and we shouldn't miss that, national energy and climate plans will be the framework for setting up targets which are going to be binding targets. And we need Again, independent monitoring of process. And I know uh, as far as for Serbia, I know we are far behind the deadline for submitting the first draft and we are far, far behind transparent and participatory process. And this is Thank something you. which should be tackled immediately. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for addressing um, this crucial issues of transparency and trust. Yeah? How should they lead us that fail to implement um, energy community um, obligations, how should they now implement green agenda? I think this is a very important question, the role of civil society in establishing a constant and effective monitoring in uh, cooperation with the EU. I think this is something, an, an everlasting task <laughs> to be improved and improved. Um, one more question by Mr. Shishko, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Dennis from Center for Ecology and Energy from Bosnia and Herzegovina from Tuzla. And basically the question I wanted to ask was partly answered by Sonia already in, in the last intervention, but I would again repeat it anyway and address it to Guillemette. And that is, <laughs> the thing is that uh, we, <laughs> it's a question of conditionality. Basically, as I repeat it on many meetings, uh, 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 quite often, and that is less carrot, more stick. So I hope that we'll see much more conditionality in disbursement of IPA funds, IPA3 funds, and much more conditionality also in the Western Balkan 6 just transition funds and everything else. And talking about that, also there is one point that should be constantly emphasized, and that is that the actual approach for just transition fund should be from bottom up. We should not allow 
the uh, central authorities or the leading uh, public utility companies like Electroprivedas actually to control the just transition fund, which is unfortunately already happening in the region. We have it already happening in Bosnia. So I would ask uh, whoever can influence this process basically to focus on the mayors of these regions because the mayors are there to provide the answers how should the support come to their areas. It's not the central government, it's not definitely the public utility company which is running the show. So question is, are we going to see more stick and less carrot or conditional carrot? And and uh, yeah, the answer on the local communities, I hope it's, it's, it's just sort of a comment from the field. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I would propose for the last eight minutes um, of our discussion um, to take also a look on the questions in the Q&A. Um, somebody's, Ms. Botic is asking again about uh, Chinese indust industrial projects in Serbia, um, warnings that have been voiced by members of the European Parliament, but it seems that so far nothing, nothing changes. Um, so what can be done about that? And again, questions of political will, um, meaninglessness of obligations, so more sticks, less carrots. Um, panelists, please um, take a look at these questions as well. And uh, in the concluding round now, do your best, please, to give, um, to comment uh, on the questions that have been posed there. Who wants to start? Um, Guillaume, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh... <laughs> It's a bit of a challenge to answer to so many questions in, uh, in limited time and touching to, to so many uh, issues. Um, but yeah, let me first make a point on the, on the monitoring um, indeed of, of the agenda. Um, of course, uh, it doesn't make sense just to have a political declaration on paper and, and no follow up. So of course, this is something that we are looking at uh, quite uh, carefully. Um, you might know that in the SOFIA declaration, the RCC, so the Regional Cooperation Council, has been mandated to basically uh, help the develop in the development of a roadmap to implement the Green Agenda and also to put in place a monitoring system. So, of course, there would be a dedicated monitoring system on the engagement on uh, which were taken and the commitment that the West Western Balkan leaders took through this declaration. And just to add that there will be also a regional project uh, up to 10 million from our side to uh, specifically implement the Green Agenda and build on what the RCC will have uh, done uh, throughout the year, whether it's a roadmap or the monitoring system. So just to let you know that we are putting mechanism in place to indeed uh, on the transparency and the monitoring uh, part. Uh, to, I mean, to answer your question on the transparency and, and monitoring part. Now, I'm very glad that the work on the NECPs were, were mentioned because uh, when it was uh, said earlier that uh, basically Western Balkan leaders did commit, but they, they don't have any targets, uh, it's not mandatory. Of course, they are not member states, so it's a bit uh, we can't, you know, take the Green Deal and just apply it to, to, the, to the Western Balkans, but still, I mean, they are candidate or potential candidates. They are aligning with the Aki, and uh, this work on the NECP, I think, is very central in the sense that it's a big effort that we are asking, but indeed, um, apart from, from the effort in itself to look at all the sectors of the society and see how emissions uh, re uh, reduction can happen, there will be a specific target for 2030 with a view of 2050. So there will be really an effort to uh, put in, uh, I mean, put the green agenda, at least in decarbonization pillar, uh, into something concrete, which is indeed a target and how uh, to reach this target. So what will be the means? Of course, it's a complicated journey. Of course, it's not straightforward, but it will take time and the energy community is, is here to, to support the countries and also member states are, are providing a lot of support. Um, so I think it's also a matter of seeing things half full, half empty in a, in a way, uh, because honestly, I, I, and I think that was also mentioned uh, by other speakers, there is a momentum now. If I compare the, the, the situation in February 2019, where we did, uh, I mean, where basically the Ministry of Energy and Environment did sign in the region a clear energy transition statement and the Green Agenda uh, from last November, there is really a difference. I mean, uh, of course, there's a lot to do, and we all agree on that, but I think the momentum is there. 
IFIs are uh, mobilized. Uh, I mean, Vladimir mentioned that they should be bolder. I think all the IFIs uh, are making now, uh, you know, eligibility criteria for their loans, uh, uh, which are basically linked to, to policy reform. So there's really a, a general movement of, of getting uh, greener and, and, you know, concretely, not only in words. Now to the last point. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe other uh, questions sorry. could be answered by the by the. Okay, sure. I just wanted to. There's touch... three more panelists here, so. Okay. I... All right. So I'll answer to Denis on the condition. Thank you so much. Bilaterally, then. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Samuel Lemesh. Um, more carrots, uh, more sticks. <laughs> I, I would like to. I, I'll try to answer two questions from the from the Q and A. Uh, the one is from Alexander Tomanich. I'm quite sure that our signature is do not understand completely how uh, what a green agenda is. They only see the money, as I, as I already mentioned in my, in my, first, uh, in my first statement. And uh, another question by Serjan Zurovic. Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, the membership, uh, the, the governments in the Western Balkans will not use the green agenda as an instrument to prevent social backlash. Uh, I think just contrary, they will, they will try to misuse the funds to uh, to delay uh, the, the solutions and try to uh, uh, try to uh, keep the coal miners uh, as their uh, just uh, mindless uh, mindless mess uh, to fulfill their political needs and uh, this is something that uh, everyone should take into account and to use again more more stick and less care Thank you very much. Vladimir, please. Okay, I, I'm not sure that we have so much time. I, 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 will, I would use this one minute just to, to send a message. I think that we open very and many interesting questions here. So my proposal is the, is the next meeting, maybe we, we should be dedicated several panels to Green Agenda, not, not just one. So I think that since that we have so many questions and, and all, all of them are very important, I think we, we, we should continue to talk about this. And, and I, would, I would finish with that. And thank you one more time for, for hearing me here. Thank you. Sonia, please. Ooh, <laughs> pressure. Um, I would just like to add, maybe uh, there are really a lot of good questions. And this is, I'm, I'm honestly glad that you included first of all, the green agenda, and it should be, I mean, the discussion started and it should really be ongoing more and more and more because this is a very important topic and the changes are just, like the grand changes are just starting in the region. The power system transformation, it's a huge endeavor and everybody should be included and it should be transparent. So I'm, I'm really glad that you included it. Uh, kudos for that. And I would just say that um, I believe for, for a just, uh, uh, let's say, energy transition, really there needs to be pressure from all sides. Markets side so we need market integration we need uh, connectivity uh, from the investor side uh, from the IFIs uh, maybe uh, a bit different from from what others think but I do believe that there is possibility to communicate with China as well on this matter to divert invest investments from dirty energy to clean energy there needs to be be a better co communication EU side the region China as well on this and of course never to forget the most important and that's the local communities to see what kind of infrastructure it's needed to see what kind of investments are needed there and to have the when when we are discussing the transformation for them to always be uh, let's say included uh, included in this in these processes the issues with the accountability of course will stay and this is something that we need to uh, just continue working on um, uh, I'm afraid but uh, let's be optimistic I mean the, the changes are already happening whether we start doing them now or just do them hastily after 10 or 20 years. It depends on, on everybody in the region well. <laughs> well. Thank you so much. Thank all, all of you, my panelists, uh, for this very engaged discussion. The good news is that there are three more working groups on the Green Agenda, I think, this afternoon and tomorrow. So I think there are lots uh, of topics to be discussed. And uh, I will now pass the floor to hans jörg Brey, one of the co-organizers of the Civil Society Forum um, to tell you about the further procedures and uh, I wish you a very nice lunch break. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, for chairing this panel. I'm now frozen. Do you understand me? Do you hear me? Okay, you do? Okay. Um, thank you 
Walter for chairing this panel. Thanks for the great contributions uh, to all the panelists here. Um, to all participants, and I have to, I'm very content that we have a lot of them, uh, more than 100 most of the time, who are listening uh, uh, to this panel. Um, the plan is as follows. We are, we are now have one hour of lunch break. You can use it for having lunch, but also for networking. Uh, you remember how to access this networking space through the cafe uh, within our uh, platform. Don't forget that we will start again at two o'clock with the working groups. As Walter said, alone three uh, working groups on the green agenda. So don't miss to come to be back uh, on our platform at two o'clock. We have 10 parallel working groups and you can access the working groups uh, within the platform through the agenda or through these two buildings like the Messe uh, Berlin and through this office building. So it's quite easy uh, to join again. So wish you uh, a good break and see you later on at two o'clock back in the working groups. Thank you for your contributions. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye.